present here in People versus Robert Durst. We're back in session. We have uh, Mr. Chesnoff and Mr. DeGuerin and Mr. Lewis in the courtroom representing the defendant. We have Mr. Milius at council table, Mr. Bailey and Mr. Henderson, Mr. Miata and Mr. Lewin at the lectern. Our witness, Dr. Elizabeth Loftus has Resume the witness stand. I'll remind you that you are under oath. You may continue with your examination, Mr. Lewin. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Loftus, over the lunch hour, did you speak to any members of the defense team at all about anything related to your testimony or payment? Well, they, they made a comment to me. But did you speak to them or provide any information to them? I didn't give them any information. They okay made a comment to me all right doctor over the break you had a chance i showed you i asked you previously before the lunch hour i asked you about a quote that you had made to uh rachel aviv in uh i guess i'm just about to do it again in either new york magazine or uh the new yorker isn't it the new yorker i keep i don't know why i keep having uh new york magazine on my mind but you're familiar with the article i'm referring to correct yes and I had asked you about a comment that you had allegedly made, and the comment was that as she walked through the courthouse, she looked as, as if she was struggling to appear somber. I have to admit, she told me later, that it is fascinating to be, you know, in the trenches with the trial of the century. And I asked you about that comment, and if that quote related to Weinstein, your prior response was, I don't think it related to Weinstein. Is that still your response? Well, the way it's uh, put in that article, it looks like I might have been referring to Weinstein, although um, I don't know why I would have called it the trial of the century. That's what they said about the OJ case. But it looks like it, the way the juxtaposition there that I was fascinated by that case. Well, I'm, I'm just asking you, doctor, because only you know, it's very clear that this quotation is referencing a comment you made about the Weinstein it, trial. It, it, it does appear that way, yes. And you said trial of the century. OJ was last century, right? Oh, well, that's true. We yeah. are in a different century, OK? Uh, doctor, I also asked you previously, and you said you wanted to see it, did your brother Robert make the following statement to, again, the author, Rachel Aviv, of, quote, if the Me Too movement had an office, Beth's picture would be on the, most, on the top 10 most wanted list. That's in the article, yes. And, and you are aware that that's what your brother said, correct? I am aware of that. And if, if that were incorrect, or if anything else in this article were incorrect, we would have expected that you would have contacted the magazine and said, hey, listen, you messed that up. That's not right. Is that correct? Objection, Your Honor. Oh. Oh. Now, overall, I think you can answer that one. Would you have I, called I, the I'm magazine? Not oh, I'm sorry, Your Would you Honor. have called the magazine if you'd... Uh... Uh, no, I did not. No, the, my, my brother made that comment. And you were aware in advance that the author wanted to interview family members, and you did not tell any of your family members, hey, listen, don't talk to them, correct? Correct, yes. You also said in that same article, doctor, um, you mentioned an issue regarding the reception you've gotten from your colleagues. The following exchange takes place. The article says, the next week at the UC Irvine Law School, meaning after you testified on Weinstein, where Lofted teaches, teaches classes, she passed by a colleague who specializes in feminist theory. Quote, Harvey Weinstein, how could you, unquote, the professor said. Quote, how could you, unquote. Loftus remembers that the conversation occurred at the buffet table at the faculty meeting, but the colleague told me, quote, I know that it didn't because I would not have stood next to her in the buffet line, Loftus said. I was reeling. How about the presumption of innocence, unquote. How about the unpopular, uh, I'm sorry, I was reeling. Back it up. Quote, Loftus said, quote, I was reeling. How about the presumption of innocence? How about the unpopular deserve to have a defense? That's what you said, correct? 
Yes. And let me ask you something. Is it your position that you took Harvey Weinstein's case simply because you believe in the, quote, presumption of innocence and that the unpopular deserve to have a defense? Is that Absolutely. why you took the case? Absolutely. So it had nothing to do with the publicity that was involved for you? No, it, I, as I testified earlier, I tried and almost succeeded to give this case to another expert, a collaborator uh, uh, from a different university, and uh, got them to hire her, and I was almost excused from the case. You would agree, doctor, that some of the criticism that you face from your colleagues doesn't just have to do with who you're choosing as clients, but the amounts of money that you are being paid to work with them. Is that a fair statement of the criticism know. you've received? It, it's, I don't know. I think it's the, they don't like these unpopular defendants. So you're not aware, doctor, of being criticized for the fact that for many of these wealthy individuals, like Bill Cosby, like Mr. Durst, you are being paid exorbitant amounts of money. That you're being paid exorbitant amounts of money, apparently a little less than you're charging today, you're now up to 700 an hour, but that you're being paid exorbitant amounts of money to come in and testify for these individuals when you don't have to. I'm being compensated for my time just as you are. Not 700 an hour, doctor. I don't know what you make, but I'm being compensated for my okay. time at a rate that's consistent with uh, many others in my field. Doctor, I want to talk about, when I say the name Sergeant Tim Hennis, is that a name that you recognize? Yes. Now, you had significant involvement in his case, is that correct? Uh, I did. I was a defense expert witness in that case, yes. In 1985, Sergeant Hennis was charged with the rape and murder of Katie Eastburn, the young wife of an Army captain, as well as the murders of their two daughters, Kara, age three, and Aaron, age five. Is that correct? I, it's, it's similar. I don't remember the exact details, but yes, he Wait. was... Wait, didn't you he, was, he was accused of murder and Doctor, murder. didn't you testify in that case in a courtroom? I did, yes. And you're telling me you don't have a memory right now of a brutally stabbed and raped woman and her two little daughters being stabbed to death? You just have a vague memory? Your Honor, I'm going to renew the 352 objection. I'll, I'll, I'll sustain it. Thank you. Doctor, are you saying that you don't remember as you sit here you don't remember the facts of the case that involved a young wife of an army officer and the deaths of her two little children. I do remember the case. Well, when I asked you a moment Your ago Honor, about... I have an objection. I'd like to have the question and the answer stricken. It's the same question. It's, 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 I don't want to make it's, a No, it's, a, it's slightly different, but I must, I'm listening to the text of the... Of the of the question itself, that one I'll, I'll overrule. But at at some point, your the lurid details of of, uh, of cases uh, are not going to be uh, relevant. In this probate. case, in this case, doctor, you dedicated a whole chapter in your 1991 book, "Witness for the Defense," to this case. Is that correct? I'm sorry. I dedicated what? an entire chapter of witness for the defense to this case. I, I, I wrote about the case, yes. Did you dedicate an entire chapter of your book, Witness to the Defense, to the Hennis case? Yes, it was one of the chapters in that, uh, in that book. So again, doctor, if you can, if I ask you a question of, did you dedicate a whole chapter, and then you don't answer, you answer a different question, it makes me have to repeat it. So if you can please answer the question that I asked. In that case, doctor, this was a situation where the woman and her two children had been murdered inside their home at Fort Bragg on the Army base. Your Honor, I'm going to object again. If, if, okay. We want to go sidebar.
You may rephrase your question. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Loftus, so it's your understanding, correct, that the mother and the, and the girls were murdered and that after the murder, there was an eyewitness who sees somebody coming down the driveway, cross-racial ID, African-American maintenance man, and a white guy coming down the driveway, their driveway at 3.30 in the morning, and the husband, you were aware, was out of town on military responsibilities. You remember those facts from your book, correct? Well, yes, I wrote that 30 years ago, but that's close well, it, to what Dr. I remember, yes. Doctor, would you agree that a case like this, in terms of remembering the gist of what happened, this is the kind of case that you don't have to try to remember, you have to try to forget. Would you agree? I remember the gist, but your initial question had a lot of details in it, and I didn't remember if all those ages and names and whatever sure. was accurate, so I so just didn't. You would agree that what happened was is that there was evidence, which you discussed in your book, that Sergeant Hennis had purchased a puppy from the family a few days before the murders, and that the police became aware of this information, and they ended up showing a photographic six-pack to the maintenance man. Do you recall that? I don't recall exactly that, but there were, there were eyewitness identification issues in that case. Do you recall, ma'am, I'm sorry, doctor, repeatedly stating in various interviews over the years that the original photographic array you had tremendous problems with and you went through and discussed why you thought that it was a bad photographic six pack. Is that correct? I I'm, I'm very well might have done that, yes. I don't recall exactly um, what that issue was in that you, old case. You detailed in your, in your book, you detailed at the time you wrote in 1991 that Sergeant Hennis had never met the family. He had no involvement with them other than purchasing the, uh, the dog. And at the time you wrote it, that's what you believed. Is that correct? Yes. And you further wrote, am I correct, that there was a woman who had seen an individual use the victim, the adult victim's ATM card at the bank shortly after the murder, and that she had originally not been able to remember anything, but then it come in to trial, the first trial, and as you said, quote, she suddenly found her memory, unquote, and identified Sergeant Hennis. You remember this, correct? I don't remember exactly, but there was a woman who used an ATM machine, and that, and that was relevant evidence in that right. case, yes. And, and you report in your book that <clears throat> in the first trial he was convicted, and that, um, after his conviction, you wrote that he had been given a new trial and that that is when you became involved in the case, correct? You were not involved in the first trial. Correct. In fact, you referred to yourself repeatedly, both in media and in your classes, as being, quote, a key witness, unquote, in the second trial, correct? I, I don't remember if I called myself a key witness. I, I just don't recall that. Well, doctor, you came into trial and you basically, in essence, through hypotheticals, provided testimony that the original six pack and the cross racial identification that went with it involving the maintenance man, as well as the memories of the woman from the ATM, you deeply criticized those identifications, correct? I, I did discuss those identifications in the case well, and in the chapter, yes. Do you discuss them in a neutral way or did you say that you had a problem that those were bad identifications? I, I, don't, I would not have used that word, no, I, or put it that way. But did, I would have talked about what was, maybe what was problematic with did, the identifications. Doctor, did you make it clear in your book, we can take it out. I can have you start going through it. Did you make it clear in your book, doctor, that you believed that those identifications were wrong, 
they were faulty and that this was an innocent man? I don't, I don't, you'll have to show me that sentence because I, that doesn't sound like exactly what, what I would have said. Well, doctor, did you believe at the time that he was an innocent man? I, I thought there was a very good chance he was an innocent man, yeah, and there were some problems with those identifications, yes. Did you testify following testimony in the Jackson case? You were asked about this. I asked you myself about this Hennis case during Jackson. Do you recall? I don't recall, no. Following exchange, this is going to be page 123, lines 5 through 17. Question. And during the retrial, you can put it up. Yeah, we'll put it up. No, show it to them oh. before you put it up. Always display to counsel. Thank you. What page, sir? 122. Let me know when you're ready, Mr. Chesnut. Can you put it up, Mr. Milius? Question. I had a chance to read it. Thank you. And during the retrial, you attacked through hypotheticals the two eyewitnesses that identified him. Is that correct? Answer. I talked about the factors that would affect the accuracy of testimony under those circumstances. Question. Ma'am, you indicated that you reviewed actual transcripts of at least one of these witnesses' prior statements and then gave your impression as to either how they had changed what they had said how things uh, had been leading, uh, et cetera. Do you recall that? Answer, well, in at least one case, she did completely change what she said. That's you, correct? That's what you said. Well, I, I, I agree. If that's in the transcript, that, that would be what I said. Doctor, would you agree that in answering my questions, that unless I show you an exact transcript or an exact article of what you previously said, you will not admit that you said anything. I, I prefer to see the evidence and then uh, give my answer. But, so you've seen the evidence and you believe that's what you said, correct? Well, I'm assuming that you didn't doctor this transcript and that it's, it's a genuine one. Doctor, really? You, you have a concern that I've doctored the transcript? No, but I will sustain your objection that that's argumentative. Strike it, please, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Doctor, do you have a legitimate concern as you sit here that you believe that I've actually doctored a transcript? I, I said exactly the opposite. I don't know what you're doing. So when you mention doctoring a transcript, can you tell me how that's relevant to your examination today? I said I assume this isn't a doctored transcript. And you felt you needed to say that for what reason? It was on my mind. Thinking that it might be a doctor transcript? No, I, I'm assuming it is not. Okay, let me continue. In the second trial where you testified, Sergeant Hennis was acquitted, correct? He was, yes. You have previously commented that your testimony was a critical factor in the acquittal, stating that the two witnesses provided testimony that was, quote, absolutely flimsy, unquote. Those are your words, correct? Uh, could you show me where I said this? Doctor, I'm going to ask the question. So if you tell me I don't recall, that's fine. So I'm going to ask you, do you recall using the words absolutely flimsy regarding I, I, the... I, you'll have to show me because I don't recall as I sit here. It's a very, very old case. So let's, let's go this way. Forgetting about what you said, you wrote a whole chapter on this case. Do you believe that that statement, that that evidence was absolutely flimsy, would have encapsulated your belief about what you thought about that evidence. I'm not asking what you said, I'm asking what you believe. Uh, well, I'm not sure. I, I thought there were some issues with the identifications in that case, and I would have talked about the science behind them. We'll, we'll, we'll come back to that. 
After his acquittal, he was acquitted in that case. He was found not guilty. You appeared with Sergeant Hennis at various media events, conferences, and television shows discussing how he was wrongly convicted of the murders due to faulty eyewitness testimony. Is that correct? I do remember uh, Joan Rivers. We were on the Joan Rivers um, program, and I believe it was 1991, 30 years ago. I, I don't remember another one, but we were definitely on that one. Is, is the Joan Rivers, is that an academic conference that you were going to to present your findings? No, uh, she invited us to appear on, the, on her show. And you would agree that you were invited and on that show that the substance of what you said about this case was this was an innocent man who was unfairly convicted because of faulty eyewitness testimony. Is that correct? I don't recall exactly what I said. Do you recall during your, and again, this is going to be uh, page 123, lines 9 through 19. Well, I've got nine on mine. Maybe it is four. Uh, question. And you refer to Timothy Hennis as someone who had been wrongfully convicted. Uh, Did you, do you have that in front of you now? I have it in front of me, but I don't. Are we now reflect, refreshing the witness's recollection? I, I, is that what you're. No, it's impeachment. <clears throat> I think you need to refresh your recollection <clears throat> before she you impeach her. She doesn't remember, Your Honor. I've attempted. Well, then that's not impeachment. That's uh, refreshing the recollection. Sidebar, yeah. Yeah. chambers. May I approach, Your Honor? You may use the uh, the wolf. Oh, Is the wolf okay. not sufficient? No, it is. You want to put it up? Senator, I'd like you to take a look at, we put up page 123 starting at line 4. I want you to read that, please. Uh, line what? 4. Uh, and you referred to Timothy Hennis as someone who had been wrongly convicted, correct? Answer, well, I believe that was true. Yeah, I believe that was true. Keep going to line 19, oh, I'm sorry. A question, at the time you believed it was true, correct? Answer, yes. Question, and you believe that the only evidence linking him with the case at that time were these two eyewitnesses, and you did not believe that in the end, that the you believed, excuse me, that based on your expertise, etc., that there were potential issues with that eyewitness testimony, is that correct? Answer, there were issues, yes. Would you agree, Doc? Did you, you don't go all the way to 19, I'm sorry. Okay, keep going. Answer, uh, uh, question. You even mentioned him afterwards in articles you wrote. Is that correct? Answer, yes. Do you agree that that testimony is correct? Yes, is that testimony accurate? Uh, uh, well, I believe this is what I said at this time, yes. <laughs> is that what you mean? No, what I mean is, is that do you believe that that testimony that you gave is factually accurate. In other words, that you not only said those things, but that at the time, that's what you believed when you said them. Yes, that's, I believed those things at the time, and, I, and I, that's what I said. I said what I believed at the time. And, and go up to the beginning, Mr. Milius, please. And you were very clear that you believed that he had been wrongfully convicted. Is that correct? At the time, okay. yes. And, Dr. I brought it before, I want to show you page uh, 114. I'm going to read this to you. I'll put it up to make it easy. Page 114, a witness for the defense. I'm not sure what the purpose is. This no, is well, the, you may examine it. Here, it's right here, this paragraph. It has to do with the flimsy comment. Okay, slow down. This, starting in the last paragraph. Yeah, to show him, let him read it at his pace. Few breaths while he's doing it. Well, I'm good. I know you're good. Take a, take a breath. It'd be better. <laughs> <laughs> that kind of hurt. Even better. Thanks, Ron. The sugar and the cookies at lunch. 
You don't drink coffee, do you? Go ahead, sorry. Doctor, you just testified a moment ago that you do not believe you would use the word flimsy, correct? Do you recall that? No, bad. You said something about bad. No, I actually asked you about flimsy as well. I, uh, well, I don't, I, I don't recall. Well, well, you'd have to read back the transcript. What I was disagreeing with, I, it's something you put in words that I would not have used. Okay, was, why don't you look it at... It was not flimsy why don't you that look, I was referring to. Well, why don't you look at the last paragraph? Read that, please. The beginning with I put? Yes. I put the legal documents and the handwritten notes back into the file folder, push it off to the side of my desk. There was no doubt in my mind these were two of the flimsiest eyewitness identifications I had ever encountered. For nine months, Sandra Barnes had no memory of seeing a man at the bank. Twice she told investigating detectives she had not seen anyone that morning. Many months later, when she had regained, in quotes, her memory and identified Timothy Hennison Court, Whoops, sorry. she said only that, quote, he looked like. This is the top of the next page. Wait a minute, what did I do here? Oops. <laughs> <laughs> the man she had seen and she admitted she was unsure whether her recognition stemmed from seeing his picture in the newspapers. So the first question, doctor, is you weren't commenting about the factors of eyewitness identification. You specifically said in your book you went after those witnesses in particular and said they were two of the flimsiest identifications you'd ever seen, correct? I said that in the book, but I doubt that I said that in the trial. That's not what I asked you. Well, doctor, you're not allowed to say that in the trial, as you know, correct? I, well, I doubt that I said that in the trial. I can have a personal opinion when I'm writing uh, a book chapter. So, doctor, I asked you before, if you recall, when we first started talking about this Hennis case, I asked you, doctor, whether or not you attacked the eyewitness identifications in this case. I didn't ask you, did you only attack it in the courtroom, or what did you say in the courtroom? I asked you, did you attack the eyewitness identifications in this case? And you would agree by calling them two of the flimsiest identifications you've ever seen. At that time, you'd been doing this for 20 years, more than that, agreed. You would say that is attacking those identifications, correct or incorrect? I, that, that was my opinion about those identifications that I expressed in the book. So, you agree that you went on and you did several different, uh, you did, you said the Joan Rivers show, you also did at least one conference with Mr. Hennis associated with at that time what was the equivalent of the Project Innocence people where you're basically standing up going, here's a man who was unjustly and unfairly accused and I helped free him because of bad eyewitness identification evidence. I don't believe that happened at that conference. He, he was, I think he was present, but I did not stand up at a conference and say that I wouldn't be likely to be bragging about myself that way. Well, doctor, isn't it true that you have taught this case? You taught it in your classes. You lectured about it regarding how you can have improper or what I'm phrasing, paraphrasing, is bad eyewitness identifications that can result in an innocent man being convicted, correct? Yes. Yes, that can happen. And doctor, you, you have lectured in your classes about that issue utilizing this case as the example, correct? Yeah, well, well this, this is a, that's a book that sometimes students read, and yes, in okay. classes. And in, in, in fact, you even have a picture of Tim Hennis in your book in Witness for the Defense, correct? Uh, well, pr probably. I don't remember quite right now. You'd have to show it to me, but uh, probably. Yeah, in, in his Army uniform, does that ring a bell or no? My, I can picture him in his Army uniform, yes. So, but. and you're aware in 2005, because the murders had occurred in an Army base, which was on federal property, you're aware the case was reopened, correct? Uh, I am aware that l years and years later, the military reopened the case, right. yes. And at the time, doctor, you were asked why you believe that investigators were still pursuing 
Sergeant Hennis, and you responded, quote, my only speculation is maybe they're embarrassed uh, that nobody's ever solved the crime. Do you recall saying that or similar things to that? I don't recall that, no. Does that, if you don't recall making that statement, does that statement, though, is that consistent with what your belief was at the time? Uh, well, at that, at that point in time, I was pretty convinced he was innocent, and it would only be later that I would have some doubts about his innocence. You would have some doubts. I just want to make sure. Some doubts about his uh, innocence. Yes, okay. I, I would have some doubts about but, his innocence later but, on. And you would characterize it as some doubts, correct? You just characterize it as some doubts about his innocence. Yes. Is that right? Right. And okay. I, as I sit here now, I have some doubts about his innocence. So you also said, correct, doctor, maybe someone believes he got away with murder and it's galling to them, unquote. That the, did that sound like something you would say? It's, it's, it sounds like I might have said something, like, if asked the question of why continue to pursue this, right. yes. Now, DNA technology, you agree, was not available at the time of the murders. Is that correct? As far as I know, yes, you're right. And eventually, you're aware that they went back when they reinvestigated this case. They ended up going back, and they recovered. They took a sample from Katie Eastburn, the mother, from her vagina, and they tested it. Do you recall that? Well, I, I believe I read something about that in the papers. I was not involved in the case anymore. So you're saying that you found out about all of this, quote, through the papers, you did not have any knowledge that this was going on? Absolutely not. So are you aware that while the results were pending, apparently this case that you had no knowledge of, you called the new charges, quote, outrageous and awful, and the reopening of the investigation fishy? I don't recall that, no. Does that sound like uh, a statement that would encapsulate your feelings? I don't time? recall that at all. Not what I asked you. Does that statement accurately encapsulate how you felt about the reinvestigation? I, I just don't remember. It was too long ago. What did the DNA results show that you were later advised of? Well, I, what I read in the papers is that, it, 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 that it, there was a claim that it was his DNA. You read in the papers that there was a claim it was his DNA. Yes, I did. Doctor, what a fair way to describe it be that individuals testified at a trial who were experts in the area of DNA, who testified that they recovered the defendant's semen from Katie Eastbrook, someone he'd never known other than to buy a dog from. Do you agree that's what you learned the results were? I, I, I only have newspaper knowledge about what happened in the military system decade, years later. You were asked about this and testified about it in the Jackson case in 2000. 12, is that correct? I don't re recall those questions, no. Gonna, can you put up page 124, lines 16 through 28? After you display it to council, and they have an no. opportunity to look at it. And you have an opportunity to, to breathe. Thank you. Can you put it up, Mr. Milius? Doctor, I'd like you to read starting at page 16. Line 16. Line 16, thank you, to line 28. A question, and it turned. I, can I get a clarification as to the purpose of. You're impeaching? Yes. Yep. Okay. Well, Am I reading? Or? Yes. So oh. what you just said. Question? <laughs> question? Uh, and it turned out they found his semen inside of her, correct? Is that correct answer? Well, that's what the paper said. I was not involved in the case, so I don't know whether, I don't know the story about that. But. Keep reading down to 20. Question, wait, you're telling me as you sit here, you don't know the story about Timothy Hennis, so you have a whole chapter about it in your book? Answer. I don't know the complete story about the case or the extent to which there was contamination or not. Question, so ma'am, what you're saying is yes, they ended up finding his DNA and his semen inside her vagina. Answer, I don't know if that's true or not. Doctor, did you have any knowledge at all that there was any contamination in this case? 
uh, actually people wrote to me afterwards uh, suggesting that there was contamination. So, doctor, I know you're, this is not your area of expertise, but you do testify. Can you explain how exactly you would be able to get somebody's semen and put it inside somebody else's slide from their vagina? Can you explain how that would work? This case was a very, very old case. Items were stored in a big box and something could have gotten mixed up with or mislabeled. But I am not an expert in that field, but that is one way something could have happened like that. And I don't have any idea really? if this happened or not. Doctor, you have had and have testified in cases and have reviewed cases involving DNA, correct? Yeah, well, you, sometimes, yeah. You are also one of the few, you're one of the outstanding number 59 in the outstanding psychologists of the 20th century, and you're a member of the prestigious National Academy of Sciences. Is that correct? No, that's incorrect. Oh, well, I was 58. I'm sorry? Oh, you're 58. I, listen, I don't want to shortchange you. Thank you. Um, that, so that fact you remember. I do. So you remember 58 versus 59, but you can't remember how many little girls Timothy Hannah is killed. I didn't say that at well, all. I want to make the same objection. Okay, this is, it's argumentative. I'm sorry? It, it's, it's, it's argumentative, argumentative and, and at an appropriate time. Yep, that's it. Thank you. Sustain. Doctor, again, <clears throat> you've talked about contamination. Can you explain to me, based on your extensive knowledge in working in criminal cases for more than 40 years, how it would be that you can magically have somebody's semen end up in a sample from someone's vagina. How can that contamination occur? Argumentative, irrelevant. Well, it is not argumentative. It is what? relevant. There's, keep okay. trying. I'll just, I'm sorry. 352. <laughs> Catch all. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm going to sustain my own objection that lacks foundation. Uh, under what ground, John? Relax foundation. You have not established a foundation for our expertise in DNA contamination. Doctor, are you aware <clears throat> that in order as a physician and just as a woman, that in order to get semen, somebody has to ejaculate to get it? Is that a fair statement? Uh, I think you can get semen from substances if it's left there. Doctor, so would you agree that you don't Your Honor, go out. Your Honor, I'm going to just, go just state, out. object. Okay, su sustain. Thank you. Thank you. It's the DNA, not the semen. I'm sorry, Your Honor. It's she, she's not an expert in the subject, and your well, your question is not is. Doctor, you're aware. You have enough expertise in the area of DNA to understand the difference between somebody leaving saliva or a skin cell versus semen. Correct? You understand that? Foundation. Wait. Sustain. So, it's your position that let me go back to my other question you yourself don't have any knowledge or any expertise that there was any contamination in this in that case is that correct i only know that some have that opinion i am not an expert and and doctor when you were asked the question in being questioned about what your position was on the case you're the one who threw up the word contamination is that correct I, I, I guess I used the word in that transcript you just had me reading from, yes? Didn't you talk in direct examination about how a client in the Innocence Project that you were involved in was freed because they found DNA that exonerated him? Do you recall that? There are 350 cases where in the Innocence Project database or more where DNA has freed innocent people. Right, so, so in your, from your position, from your thought process, from who you are as the author of Witness for the Defense, DNA only has value, apparently, when it exonerates people, not when it inculpates them. Is that correct? Sustained. Doctor, does DNA have a valid use to both inculpate and exculpate? Yes. So my question to you would be, doctor, that given what you know about the situation, you learned at the time that Timothy Hennis was convicted 
in 2010, you learned then or shortly thereafter the facts of what we've just discussed. Is that correct? From, from the newspapers, right. yes. And you were aware then that at that point in time that he had been, his semen had been found and he had been convicted. Is that right? That was the claim in the newspaper. Were you aware, did you have any involvement in the third trial? No. You were aware, though, that Timothy Hennis changed his defense to not I didn't know her, but I was having a consensual sexual relationship with her? You're aware of that, correct? I don't know the details of that. I was not involved in that case. Wait, so you're telling me a case that you thought important enough to devote a whole chapter of your book to, you have never been interested in learning what the story ended up being? You just don't know? I have been interested, but I haven't had anyone to, 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 to you know, that I've been interacted with to tell me exactly exactly what happened. So, so Doctor, you're aware that you can go Google Tim Hennis's name or look up the case that he was involved in and you can get all the facts that I just indicated, correct? I have there is press coverage of that of that third case, yes. So my question to you was you're telling me that you were not aware let's go another way, withdraw. When did you become aware that Mr. Hennis had changed his defense from I don't know her other than buying a dog to, you know what, I had sex with her? Uh, I, I do believe that somebody said that the defense attorney made that argument and somebody else thought that this, the, this was not a, a proper argument. And, but I don't know anything about that case. This is all just rumor and innuendo. You would agree, doctor that the very identifications you attacked as being two of the worst identifications you'd ever seen turned out to have been absolutely accurate, correct? Uh, I, I disagree with that. You can, somebody could conceivably be guilty and the identifications could be bad. Which, let me understand this. So these two witnesses identified Timothy Hennis as having been the individual that they saw. One sees him coming out of the house, one sees him using the ATM. And you're saying, you know what, he could still be guilty, but those identifications are still wrong, are still bad. Is that your position? Well, what I remember about the woman at the ATM machine is supposedly she used the machine something like four minutes uh, after the Timothy McVeigh person or whatever. And I think you're, uh, you're, mixing your, you're mixing your killers. I think you mean Tim Hennis, not Timothy McVeigh. Hennis. Thank you. <clears throat> so I, I, you know, there, you know, I did have, I did have questions about, you know, what guilty people take money out of somebody else's ATM machine and hang out around for four minutes um, waiting for the next person to show up. There were, there were, there are reasons, serious reasons to question that identification even if it turns out that Timothy Hennis um, was guilty. Are you still disputing, as you sit up here, is it still your position? You said there were some issues with the case. Oh, I'm just asking, as you sit here right now today, you are aware that Timothy Hennis murdered Katie Eastbrook and, uh, Katie East, uh, Eastburn, excuse me, and her two daughters, correct? You don't dispute that. I don't know if that's true. I know he was convicted, okay. but innocent people get convicted and sometimes guilty people get acquitted. Both mistakes it, it, happen. Isn't it true, doctor, that when you found out about Sergeant Hennis's DNA, his semen inside of the victim, that you didn't want to admit it because it demonstrated that the very eyewitness identifications you had attacked had turned out to be accurate and that in fact it makes you look like when you're criticizing these identifications that you're just wrong. Did I assume facts not Overruled. Your Honor. Overruled. I can't agree with that, no. So you don't think that those, you don't think the semen in that case proved you wrong? Well, certainly, if, if he is truly guilty, and for a period of time I believed 
he was innocent and wrongly convicted, then I was wrong. And, and in fact, you were asked in 2012 during the Jackson case, was it fair to say that you were confident that he had been wrongly accused? And you respond, I did feel that way, correct? That's, I still feel that that is the way I felt at the time, yes. And you were asked again during the Jackson case, the question, you were wrong, weren't you? And you answered, I don't know if I was wrong or not. Well, ma'am, so isn't it true that they ended up going back and they found his DNA inside of the victim's vagina? Is that correct, ma'am? And your answer, that is the claim, that is the claim decades later, yes. Is that what you said? Okay, let's uh, <clears throat> sidebar. <clears throat> Oh, thank you. Doctor, I want to be clear because I think I asked a confusing question. I'm talking about your testimony in Jackson where you were being asked about the Hennis case. I haven't asked you anything about the facts of Jackson. You understand that, correct? Uh, yes, I, 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 I don't remember if you did. Ask okay, about I just want to make sure Jackson, that you understand. But... During your testimony in 2012 in, in Jackson, you continued to argue, correct, that despite the presence of Hennis semen inside of, of this young mother, that uh, he had only met her to buy a puppy, and you continued to still insist that he might not have committed the crime, correct? I just don't know the details of that case. Did the following exchange, Jackson, page 125, lines 19 through 25? Do you have that up? Mr. DeGarren, do you have it? 19 through 25. Okay. <clears throat> Can you read 19 through 25? Well, 19 is Actually, in. Actually, it should be 18, I'm sorry. The question is, and ma'am, you would agree that after this book came out, that's wait, when... Wait, let me, let me stop you. I apologize. I think you've got the wrong site. One second. Because this would be cumulative, Your Honor. 125, one second. Okay, cumulative objections overruled. This time. <clears throat> Should have been 126 lines 23 through 19 through 25. I just had the wrong, the wrong page. I apologize. Yes, thank you, sir. All right. So start reading a page in that line 19. Uh, 19, ma'am. You would agree that it would appear that those eyewitnesses in that case who had described Mr. Hennessy, it would appear, based on what you know about the case, they were right. 
Answer, well, there is. There's a possibility that one of them was right. I think there's much less of a possibility the other could have possibly been right. Did you say that? Yes. Doctor, do you still believe that to be true? Uh, yes, I would agree with that. All right. During your 2012 testimony, when you were confronted with the semen that was found, do you recall responding that you did not know if in fact it was true about semen being found because, quote, I never saw the evidence, unquote? I don't recall saying exactly okay. that, but I, well, I have only newspaper knowledge about this, this situation. Page 128, lines 9 through 17. Through 23? No, I think it's 9 through 17 by mine. Oh, yes. Okay. I'll ask you about the rest. Okay. Put up 9 through 17, please. Can you read that, Doctor? From not line 9? Yes. Question. Ma'am, does the fact that they found the man's DNA, his semen, inside of a woman, that he says he only meant to buy a dog from, did that affect your belief in the statements you just made? Answer, I don't know if that's true or not because I never saw the evidence. Shall I keep going? No, th that, that's it. So my question is, are you saying, doctor, that unless you personally see the evidence, meaning you're saying I didn't see the DNA evidence, so I don't know if it exists, that you don't feel comfortable commenting on the results, is that correct? Well, I'm, you know, I might have an opinion about if, if there really was his semen in her, then, and there was not contamination from materials that resided in a box from 30 years ago, then one could reasonably infer that maybe they had that either there was sex or a rape or something happened, yes. So, doctor, how many of those 350 DNA exonerations that you talked about have you actually seen and reviewed the DNA evidence yourself? Well, I have maybe worked on a, a few of those cases. But well, doctor, when you were talking about DNA exonerations with Mr. Chesnoff, you never mentioned, but by the way, I didn't actually see that evidence myself, did you? No, I've, I've mostly read the scholarly work about that uh, database. So what you're, would you agree, doctor, that what you're basically saying is, is that as an advocate up there, that unless the DNA is leading to the defense perspective and result you want, you're just going to say, I don't trust it. Is that correct? No, that's not true. All right. Um, you were asked, correct, during your testimony, you were asked about if, in fact, there was a scenario where it turns out, yep, Sergeant Hennis did commit the murders. Would such a scenario be embarrassing to you? Do you recall what you responded to that? That's going to be page 128, lines 24 through 28. Of course I don't recall. Okay. Now when you look at it, yeah. Okay. 24 to 28, please. You can read that. 24. Question. Ma'am, you would agree that if it turns out that, in fact, he is guilty, you would agree that at least to some degree that is a little bit embarrassing for you. Answer. Well, I feel very sorry for his family, frankly. So. Were you referring to the husband? of the murder victim, or are we referring to Sergeant Tim Hennis? I, I, I don't recall what I was thinking back then. It may have been, it may have been the Hennis family, his wife, his yeah. kid. Yeah. I, I just don't recall. Okay. Take a look, uh, counsel. Page 128, lines 9 through 22. And I'm just about done, Your Honor, with, with this area. 
128 lines 9 through 22. <laughs> What's that? All right. What, what lines, please? Hold on. Uh, 129, starting with, the, with line 1. 129, 1, 2, 22. It's a lot of citations for me to keep track of. I apologize that some have turned out to be an error. Yeah, we read it. Thank okay. you. Please read starting at line one. Again, Your Honor, is this to refresh the witness's recollection? If it's to refresh, then you should uh, no, show is, her the document. This is for impeachment, Your Honor. Uh, then I object. The case is staying. I think I'll, I'll, show I'll, I'll, I'll let you uh, approach the witness and show her the document so that you don't project it on the screen before oh, okay. you're allowed to impeach her. All right. You're refreshing her recollection. That's different. May I approach? Yes. Okay. Doctor, this is continuing with the, the, it leaves off at the last comments. You might want to read starting on page 128, line 24, and then read all the way down to line 22 on the next page. Just let me know That's what to refresh your recollection, so read it to yourself yes. silently. Okay. Down to 22? 22. Yes. Yes, okay. A moment ago, I asked you if you understood, were you referring to Mr. Hennessy's family or the victim's family? Does this refresh your memory as to who you were referring to? Uh, yes. Who were you referring to? Uh, I. I was referring to Mr. Hemp Hennis and, and his family, his wife and his, his kid. You were then asked, what about the family of the victims, correct? Yes. And then you said, I feel sorry for them too, but you agree your first thought went to Mr. Hennis's family, not the victims, is that correct? Yes. Did you ever meet the husband of the woman and the two little girls? Uh, uh, according to that test that transcript, apparently I might he may have been in the courtroom during the trial on the same day I was there. And your comment was that you had no memory of meeting the surviving husband, correct? Uh, I, by that time I had, had had no memory of meeting him. No. Isn't that something that you would expect that you'd remember? Not necessarily, not after that long period of time. All right. So, in 2010, there was an Orange Coast magazine profile on you that discussed the Hennis case. Is that correct? Uh, I don't recall that particular profile, but it may have happened. You, would you like me to show it to you to refresh your recollection? I can do that, or would you? If you're going to ask me whether I said something, yes. Okay. Doctor, do you recall having inter any, any interviews or giving any statements regarding the Tim Hennis case after he was convicted with the DNA in his third trial? Do you recall that at I all? Don't, I don't 
recall doing an interview on that no. would, would you agree that if you would have given an interview you would not simply have said in discussing the Hennis case that this was a person who was convicted on eyewitness identification testimony and then acquitted you would have just said that you would have added but later on they discovered that in fact he had been connected by DNA etc you wouldn't have only told half the story after the fact right uh, I, I do what we're talking about. Uh, 2010 Orange Coast Magazine profile. No, I, well, I, I have several different ways I can ask it. This is one of them. Go ahead. So, doctor, do you understand my question? My question is, assuming that you would have discussed the Hennis case after you became aware and you said you read about it from newspaper clippings, so after he was convicted in 2008, if you would have given interviews, you would have certainly stated that in fact he was convicted originally, I testified, but you would have explained, but you know what, he ended up being convicted after they found DNA in the dead mother. You would have certainly... Well, typically that's what I do in my class. We talk about the... Uh the subsequent uh, military uh, conviction. Right. Would you agree that if you had just said that he had been convicted of rape and murder and won a new trial at which he was acquitted, that if, if that's all you said about it, that would have been misleading? Would you agree? Uh, well, it would, have, it would have not mentioned what sub, sub, subsequently happened. And would you think that's misleading in the context of discussing this case? It depends on whether that was just a snippet of a, of a quote or I, I just don't know. I'd have to look at the context. No, I'm, I'm, really, I'm not asking what the quote is. I'm merely saying you would agree that you could not have a discussion of the Timothy Hennis case without also saying in the end they found his semen inside of that mother and that he was convicted of her rape and murder. You would have to tell that part of the story as I well. don't know if that's true. I'm not asking whether you said it. I'm saying, do you agree that as an academic, as someone who is trying to make sure that the science is correct and that you're out there giving an unbiased recitation of what happened, that you would have to give the whole story. You couldn't just stop it with he was acquitted after the second trial. You agree you would have to tell the rest of the story, right? It depends on, on, on what question was asked. Doctor, so you're saying you think it would be proper that there could be a context where this case is coming up and where you would mention the Timothy Hennis case, mention that he was wrongfully uh, convicted the first time, then acquitted, but then not mention, you know what, later they found his DNA, his semen, and he was convicted. That's, well, what... I don't know about that evidence, but we do talk in my classes about the subsequent military trial. So that would be typically what I would do if I've got the freedom to, to do that. You, I asked you previously about Jerry Sandusky, correct? Do you recall that? Yes. And he was the assistant football coach at Penn State with Joe Paterno, is that correct? Yes. And You've stated that you wrote a letter to Mr. Sandusky while he was in custody stating it must be terribly difficult for you and your family and I hope you have the legal help needed to resolve your situation justly. Do you recall writing such a letter to Mr. Sandusky? I, I responded to a letter he wrote to me. At the time you would have written that letter, you were aware of what the allegations were, correct? Y yes. The allegations involved him allegedly molesting dozens of, of children over many years, correct? Those were the allegations, yes. What would make you take the time to write a letter to a man accused? You're not working for him at that time, right? I, I write to prisoners every, every month who write to me. How many it's victims? My practice. How many victims do you write to? If victims write to me, I write back to them, assuming they're not rude to me. 
So if, if, if the accusers want to meet with me or talk to me, I talk to them, assuming they're not rude to me. So let me try to ask my question again. How many victims have you written letters to in your entire career? Victims. Is it even one? Uh, well, I, uh, there are plenty of them. When they write to me, I write back if they're polite. So again, I'm going to I'm going to ask you again. You're right, I'm going to object. I'm going to ask an answer. As you sit here today, do you have any recollection of ever writing a letter to a victim in a case? Well, I've ever I've written to accusers, people who are uh, are feel they're victims. I mean, assuming, including one not long ago who accused a, a, a prominent TV journalist. Okay. And, and I had a, a long subsequent conversation with her. Let me ask you, ha have you ever in your career, have you ever looked at a case, been hired on a case to review materials, and come back and said, you know what, um, I think that the memory issues in this case or the eyewitness issues in this case, I think they're solid and I'm not going to take it. Yes. But going through, Ted Bundy wasn't one of those cases, correct? No, but uh, sometimes lawyers right. call me, give right. me the, the facts of their situation, and right then after a 20-minute phone conversation, I say, I don't think there's very much uh, helpful for you that a memory expert can say. And that's the end of the interaction. But, but you thought that there were helpful things that a memory expert could say, for instance, in Jerry Sandusky's case, in Bill Cosby's case, in Harvey Weinstein's case? Absolutely. Would you agree, doctor, that with respect to, in any case, a defendant's actual guilt or innocence, that the jury hearing the case they have far more information about the case than you ever do. No, I wouldn't always agree with that, but often, and, and particularly in this case, as long as they've been at it, I um, imagine they, they do have a lot of information, but it might not in every case be as much as I might have because they may not have access to some of the information that is communicated to me. So would you agree in this case, have you, been, have you watched the entire trial? No. Would you agree that these jurors sitting over here have far more information about the specifics of this case than you do? Possibly, yes. But, but you won't, that's not a definitive statement for you. I, I, I am not sure if there are things that have been kept from them that I may know about. I just don't know that. Do, do you think, is it your job, would you agree that your job is much different than that of a jury's? Yes, I'm a scientist. Yet yeah, jurors don't consider I'm sorry, you don't consider other factors that support or corroborate evidence in the case. You are just looking at whether it's eyewitness or memory. You're looking at a very narrow area, correct? Well, sometimes it's a key area, but yes, I'm, I, my field is memory. Okay. Well, so, so, so let me ask you. So if you tell me there's DNA in this case, or, then I, I don't know about it. What, what about a recorded confession or more than one? Would that affect your analysis of a case. Objection, Your Honor. Relevance. You're not an expert <laughs> on what he just asked what, about. What? Uh, a rule. You would want to know the circumstances of, the, of, the, of a confession, whether in, in a typical case, whether it's coerced, since coerced confessions are another sometimes cause of wrongful right. convictions, um, whether it's an authentic uh, memory for a confession or one that's a creation, there, there's just but, a lot more to, to learn about. But you agree when you look at, for instance, in this case, when you look at and you analyze and you're given hypotheticals, you're only looking at the information oh. you're given Question. in the hypotheticals, correct? I you responded to the hypotheticals. Right. But those hypotheticals, if either A, those hypotheticals are factually wrong, then you would agree your opinion. Your Honor, I've got a hypothetical. 
question? <clears throat> so uh, to restate it, the jurors would be instructed that, that if they do not find facts to support the hypothetical. So, uh, we continue. so if the facts are not present, that's... So doctor, if a hypothetical question. is presented to you and the facts in that hypothetical turn out to be incorrect, would you agree that your conclusion, your answer to that hypothetical would not have any value? Kind of well, junk I, in, junk out. Agree? I responded to the hypothetical and uh, tried to connect the scientific uh, findings to the facts of the hypothetical. Doctor, can you please listen to the question I'm asking? Because you're not answering what I'm asking. Just listen carefully. If you are given a hypothetical and the facts as represented in that hypothetical are wrong or inaccurate, would you agree that any conclusion you give based on that hypothetical is worthless. I, I, I can't agree with that. So, well, doctor, if you're giving an opinion that's based on assumed facts in a hypothetical, and if those assumed facts turn out to be true, how on earth could your opinion have any value? False. False. It turned out to be false. Excuse me. Thank you. Freudian. Peanut gallery. Well, either way. Well, yeah, ask it both ways. <laughs> Sorry, Your Honor. Do you understand my question? It would be up to the jury can then decide. No, listen to my question. You're an expert. You're given hypotheticals. That's what experts are given. If the facts that are in the hypothetical turn out to be wrong or unsupported, you're giving an opinion that is based on those facts in the hypothetical you're given being correct. Is that true? Uh, the, connecting the scientific work to the structure of that hypothetical, yes. It, that's, the con that's the connection that I was drawing. D doctor, I'm going to say it very plainly. So I want you to assume, I'll, I'll do it in the form of a hypothetical. If someone asks you a hypothetical, doctor, I want you to assume that there is a little boy who's on a blue bike and the following situation happens. And it turns out that there wasn't a little boy it was an adult woman, and she wasn't on a blue bike. She was in a car. Would you agree that the opinions, the conclusions that you give in response to that hypothetical would be worthless because the facts that you were given were themselves inaccurate? Would you agree? I, I, I'm having trouble with the word worthless. The science connects to the hypothetical that I was given. If somebody wants to apply them to a different fact situation, then, then that, where it might not fit, then that might be inappropriate. Doctor, you graduated summa cum laude from UCLA, correct? Yes. You have a PhD from Stanford, correct? Yes. And are you telling me that you're not understanding my question, which is very simply, I'm going to say it again, if you are given facts in a hypothetical, and those facts turn out to be wrong or unsupported. So I'm having you assume right now that the facts you were given in a hypothetical were completely wrong and unproven. Wouldn't you have to agree that any opinion you gave as a result of that hypothetical would have no value because the underlying facts are not true? It's a pretty simple concept. Well, I, I'm not going to call my opinion worthless, so uh, no matter how many times you try to get me to do that, uh, the jury can decide if the facts fit. So, so what you're saying is, doctor, is it doesn't matter what the underlying facts are, what the hypothetical is. It doesn't matter whether the hypothetical has nothing to do with, with a case. Your position is, if you give a conclusion, if you say something, it has value whether or not the facts you are basing it on are completely wrong. Is that your testimony? It has, it has a, a connection to the specific hypothetical that I was asked about. But if, and it still does. Again, doctor, if, in, if it turns out that the facts in the hypothetical are completely wrong, how can there be a connection? The facts were wrong and you gave a conclusion based on the facts you were given. Well, Wouldn't you have to respond, doctor? Well, shouldn't your response be, you know what, no, if the underlying facts I'm given are wrong, then my conclusion based on that fact, those facts, isn't going to have any value. Uh, the conclusion could be accurate, but uh, the jury may want to just ignore it, uh, is, what I, is the way I would put it. They, they would just ignore it if it didn't fit the facts as they remember them. So, doctor, 
I'm asking you, though, in advance, I'm asking you to assume, this is the last try I'm going to make here. I'm asking you to assume that facts you are given in a hypothetical turn out to be completely wrong. Your Honor, and I that, to the no, argument. Wait, move to strike the part. This is the wait, last time I'm going to try this. I will strike that part. The, uh, the commentary is not necessary. Can, it's, can, I, I Your Honor, could it's the court instruct the witness? I've asked the question. I'll instruct you to move to something else. I'm sorry? You've covered it. You have an, you have an answer here. Thank you. Move on. Afternoon break, Your Honor? Sure. Let's take a break. Fine idea. 3.30, ladies and gentlemen. Do not converse among yourselves or with anyone else on any subject connected with this case. Do not form or express any opinion on the case. All right, our jurors have uh, left the courtroom, and, and so the, the part that's annoying me a little bit, Ms. <clears throat> Mr. Lewin, is you're acting as if the witness is not responding to your question, and logically there may be value to the hypothetical because of the dynamics of the relationship of factors. So yes, the jury may well disregard that conclusion. They probably should disregard it, but to say it has no value I think is, uh, it certainly has a, a, a credibility value, but, but you can, regardless of the variables, one can dis still discern, I mean, to give a reductio ad absurdum, uh, you, both of their, you, you know where you're on planet Earth, if, uh, if it's a blue bike or it's a blue car, it doesn't matter. I mean, it depends on the question, it depends on the fact and issue, and you're asking this in a, in a, in a vacuum. So, so that's the problem with your, your, your questions. Your Honor, and, and here's the issue. Um, if looking at the scientific method, which I do not want to have to go through, but I can. No, I, I understand the scientific if, method. What, if I can just explain where I'm coming from. It is very clear, and the doctor knows very well, that as an expert witness, you are only giving opinions through hypotheticals. It is assumed when a hypothetical Well, that's not always true. What, what, that's right. not always true. But here it is, it is as a practical matter in this case, yes. So, uh, she is proffered as a witness who's talking about the dynamics of memory and, uh, and she's simply uh, uh, responding to hypotheticals. Now, there's a problem with the hypotheticals that were given, but. Your Honor, every hypothetical that was given was based on sworn testimony in the case. Yeah, I, I know that, but I mean, there's a problem with any hypothetical, and that is that it's out, out of the context. I mean, out of, you talk about these different phases using her model of, of uh, acquisition, retention, and uh, retrieval, and in each context, there's additional facts that aren't presented that, that are very, very important. So, you, yes, you give the salient fact, but there are other dynamics that weigh those facts in, in a way that... I mean, the, the, supposedly it's neutral, but obviously it, it is indeed weighted in, in favor of uh, the defense. That's, that's, and that's fine. I mean, I think that's fine to present that. I've got no problem with it, but just to pretend that it's, it's you know, pure is, uh, is, is not, not so. I mean, I think it, it can be attacked for, about the field itself can be attacked. Uh, I don't think that's wise because I think there is value to the field, the application is subject to attack, and, uh, and the witness is subject to attack uh, also. But, but uh, so anyway, I stopped you because, because you're, you're, uh, it's, you've gone too long on that point. All right, I'll move on. Anything else? No. No? no? Okay. Recess. <laughs>